Hello everyone. Welcome to Computer Science E7. This is Lecture 12 Artifacts. So I hope all of you had a very happy uh, Thanksgiving holiday and enjoyed uh, the wonderful weather that, uh, that we had. Um, and I do want to remind you that uh, the last assignment, assignment four, was due today, uh, about four minutes ago actually. And uh, we will um, be, uh, be giving you back the feedback for all of for that assignment and the rest if you haven't as soon as possible. Um, also, you should have heard back already on your um, uh, final project proposal. If you haven't, we may not have received it from you or something may have happened, so be sure to uh, send us an email if you expected feedback on that and, and you did not. Um, I also want to say that uh, your banners, uh, those will be going up throughout the week, and so we should hopefully have all of those up by, by next week, and we can show those off to, uh, to the rest of you. So just as a quick reminder from last week, uh, our lecture on color, we talked about a number of things dealing with color, and, and we introduced some of these topics by talking about how difficult we have, how difficult of a time we have actually being very um, accurate with color in terms of our eyes because our, our eyes and our brains more specifically can play tricks on us and if you recall we showed some optical illusions where, uh, where we were trying to basically just show you that color perception or even luminance detection perception is difficult uh, to, to get truly accurate and uh, we described or we showed you this particular graph of uh, uh, that represents basically the entire range of color that the human eye can see. So everything from uh, the, the ultraviolet or near ultraviolet range all the way up to uh, the near infrared. And if you recall what we used, uh, or the whole point of showing this graph was to be able to describe not only these monochromatic colors that exist on the outside, so each of these are just one specific wavelength, and more specifically, just one specific color that's very, very saturated. And then all of the mix of the colors that can happen in between. So if we happen to mix two monochromatic colors, we would get a color in the middle that matches approximately what we would see on this particular graph. And this, the reason that this graph is useful to us is because we can use it as a way to show and to describe color spaces. So what's possible for a computer to display or what is possible for a camera to capture or a scanner to capture or a printer to print out in terms of its constituent colors and also all of the blends of colors that are therefore possible from, from those major colors that, that are possible. And so this uh, graph and this diagram in particular is showing us the sRGB color space because as you recall we have three color we have um, three different sets of color values. So a red set, a green set, and a blue set. And each of those is described by these points on the triangle. And when we combine all of them at maximum value, we get a white that's called D65 somewhere in the middle of this particular triangle. And so if you recall, we also showed you a different color space called Adobe RGB. And how did that one differ from this color space? Yeah, so it extended the blues, the blue and the red was pretty much the same, but the green extended a lot farther into the, into the range of greens that we can actually see. Uh, and so it's important to keep in mind that we're, we're still describing these color sets with these 256 values, these 8 bits of values that we've been talking about all, throughout all this time in terms of JPEGs. But it's what, is, it's what each of those values represents on screen that matters, and that is what this color space is talking about. And as you recall, we were using a paint by numbers analogy, basically, where we have these numbers that are described in the file, and then the computer tries to figure out what color that number represents by using not only the color space, but also it applies the color space to that number, and then it uses the, the monitor profile to show you to make that color accurate on your particular screen. And so we need, now that we have multiple color spaces, we need a way of being able to convert between them. And so we have two, two of the major ways are perceptual gamut mappings and colorimetric gamut mappings. And so for us as photographers, the ones that we would typically use is perceptual. But when we are displaying colors on screen, for example, and we need it to be very, very accurate, just the range of colors that we are seeing on that particular screen, we might use colorimetric with the knowledge that 
any more saturated colors at either end could be clipped. And there could actually be more details there, uh, but that's the, the price that we have to pay for, for this particular gamut mapping. Then of course we talked about profiling monitors, so calibrating them so that you will be able to get accurate color out of your monitors and that there's this, there are different color charts out there, but this is a, a pretty common one uh, called the, uh, a Macbeth color checker um, uh, uh, chart and you can use it, I mean it's a little difficult frankly to look at it and just be able to discern, okay well I know that my, this red looks just the tiniest bit off. It's, it's really hard to do that and typically what we would do is use a hardware profiler uh, to be able to correct the monitor to be absolutely perfect. And uh, there are, there do exist software um, tools to do that as well. They're just perhaps not as accurate and it's also harder on your eyes because you generally have to squint to be able to get it just right. And one of the things that I neglected to mention last week um, that I did want to talk about was, and although I did touch on it slightly, uh, was the fact that uh, there are different types of, of LCD monitors available out on the market today. So I mentioned that there's usually ones available for desktop monitors that are higher quality than the ones in laptop monitors, but I don't think I was very specific. So just uh, to give you a quick rundown, there's various types of um, monitors that exist out there today. So of course there's the CRT monitors, the big tube type ones. And that's not really what I'm referring to. Those, the, the old ones could be a very, very color perfect almost in a way and, and uh, you'd be able to get very nice color out of them even out of the box. But LCDs are not all made the same. There's different quality LCDs and determining what type of panel is in your monitor is, is important, especially if you're going to purchase a new one. It's important in being able to get the best color. So there's a variety of ones, uh, SIPS, SPVA, and STN. There might be some other ones available now, but basically SIPS is currently the best on the market in order to get the most color uh, uh, correct on your monitor. So if you're looking for a new monitor, this might be something that would interest you and, and might weigh your decision in one monitor towards another uh, when, when looking at these different panels. So these cheaper, these cheaper panels, the, P, the SPVAs and the STNs, they just don't render color as accurately as these IPS panels. And typically you will find these more expensive and more, more color accurate panels in higher end models. So Dell has, has a number of models that have SIPS panels. Apple, for example, it's one of the reasons why a number of these are so much more expensive than similar ones. It's, it's, they just have different quality panels within them. And another thing that's important to note is, as I mentioned it before, but laptop displays are pretty significantly worse than their desktop displays. And, and to make this a little bit more uh, quantitative for you, desktop displays typically can show us about eight bits worth of color. So within their gamut, it's possible they can display the eight bits that, that, we, that we know and that we are familiar with. But laptop displays, in order to make them cheaper and smaller, thinner, et cetera, typically might only have six bits worth of color information. So you, even if it's kind of color accurate, it's not, going to be, it's not going to be able to display all of the colors that you expect it to. And so this can be a bit of a problem for us when we need to edit our photos on our computer screen it might be slightly off than what we expect. And uh, so even though the software says, okay, well, you have millions and trillions of colors available, the, the hardware actually does a little bit of a trick called dithering, where it slightly modifies neighboring color pixels to try to simulate some color. So as you know, what we were talking about before is that you can mix two colors, of course, to get a, a resultant color. And these, and, uh, these hardware panels or these panels will try to do that same sort of trick by making neighboring pixels very, very similar but not quite the same color and then you might be tricked into seeing a third type of color but it's not, it's not exactly the same thing. So that is something to keep in mind and of course gamma, uh, when, you're mo when you're profiling your monitor you should set your gamma to 2.2 as that seems to be now the standard across pretty much everything. And um, I should mention one more thing. When you do profile your monitor, you can't just call a day and quit right there. You do actually have to continue profiling your monitor at regular intervals. If it's a relatively new display, you might get away with doing it once every few months. But as the display ages, its quality also worsens. And so you might have to profile it more, quit, more, uh, more frequently 
or just do it, uh, well, yeah, I mean, definitely you would have to profile it more frequently in order to determine if it's actually maintaining the color that's promised to it. And so one of the last things we talked about in regards to color is white balance and how when we are talking about or when we're taking a photo with a digital camera, the camera has to pick a particular um, uh, Kelvin temperature that is associated with white in that particular in that particular scene. And so as you might recall, there are a variety of whites that can exist within this color space, ranging from a sort of cool blue tones to sort of a warm red tones. And counterintuitively, the values for those are opposite what we would expect, because the blue tones, the cooler tones, have a higher Kelvin temperature than the warmer tones, the, the, uh, the cooler ones. And the reason for that, of course, is this idea that this actually does relate to temperature. And the hotter something gets, the bluer it actually will become. So like a blue, uh, blue hot flame, for example, is hotter than a red flame, so on and so forth. That's what, that same sort of thing happens here. And so we used white balance as yet another reason why raw might be a good idea for us, uh, because it allows us to set the white balance after the fact and be able to get the most quality out of our particular photos. Any questions on all this stuff? Great, so today we're gonna to talk about some artifacts. And I know everybody is, is still sort of, you know, hunched over from eating too much turkey, unless you're me and you didn't have any turkey at all. I, it's, it's, now it's this ongoing thing. I'm determined not to have any turkey on Thanksgiving. But anyway, um, uh, so I, I'm hoping that this will be a relatively short and relatively painless lecture, but uh, we do have a number of things to talk about, so let's get started. So in terms of artifacts, there are a number of ways that we can get weird artifacts within our images. And so we can have, we have a word uh, synonym for this called aberrations that can represent a number of things. So we might have, for example, optical aberrations, something that happens in the, in, as a result of the optical change. So somewhere from the lens where the light's traveling through the, the lens elements all the way through to the sensor itself. And obviously there might be other aberrations as well that can happen uh, because of the digital conversion that can happen within the sensor, a variety of other things. We'll talk about a number of these aberrations that will happen. So as you might recall, a lens is not a, is not a very simple thing. It's a very complex object with uh, a lot of smart people that uh, do this all the time, trying to calculate where the light is going to bend uh, through its path through the lens. And um, if you recall the, uh, that one video from the optics lecture about how lenses are made, it's even to this day, it's not a very simple process. There is still a lot of um, hand uh, manual labor involved in creating especially these high quality lenses. It's not something that can be truly, truly automated. So sometimes we will get problems with these lenses. Um, and, and even though they might be very, very good lenses, there might still be problems with them. And even super expensive lenses are not completely free of defects. So um, I do want to mention that, of course, we do have a front element and a back element on each of these lenses. You can get dust or grime or fingerprints on each. And as you recall from some of the, uh, the I think that one web page I showed earlier in the semester where someone had actually cracked the front element in that lens, the front element is, is frankly not as important as the back element to keep clean. So given the choice, you really want to prioritize and try to keep the back element clean, as clean as possible, particularly because some lenses, it might be recessed into the body of the lens somewhat and might be difficult for you to get into. And that's something that you don't want to have to pour cleaning solution into and get it inside of your lens. That's just going to be a bad thing for you to do. Um, now, dust on the front of the lens and grime will actually cause a loss of contrast. For those of you that, like me, wear glasses and you notice that it gets really, really filthy after a while and you're like, oh, I can't see a thing. I need to go to the eye doctor. Then you just, uh, just out of habit, you clean your glasses and you're like, wow, it's like I just bought a new pair. It's that same sort of thing. You, um, you do need to periodically clean your lenses in order to keep the contrast relatively high. But okay, besides all of that sort of obvious stuff, there are actually problems that can happen as the light bends inside of the lens, uh, including some geometric distortions that can happen to the, the path of light itself. So normally when we're looking at a, a point source, that is, you know, let's say it's very, very far away, like a star, for example. So 
because that light is very, very far away, as the light travels to us, it eventually becomes parallel. So what's happening here is that this is light from some very, 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 very far away object that's you know, essentially a point. That is what these straight lines are trying to indicate to us. So when we focus this light, we want it to also become a point on the sensor plane itself, right? So that way it is represented accurately on our sensor or on our film. Now sometimes though, there are lenses that will actually misshape the light or, or redirect the light incorrectly inside of the lens and you will get this sort of strange conglomeration of, of photons on your sensor. And so if you can imagine what would happen if rather than having a point source focused very cleanly like this, this sort of spherical aberration occurs within the lens. What do you think might happen to the image of this point source? So just imagine it's a black, black sky with one star that you're trying to take a photo of and it should render just, you know, on your images, just one very small point. What would it look like in this image here? So not quite like a starburst, it's just more general. It'd just be softer and just, just sort of like this large disc might look almost out of focus or even, I mean, it has a, a specific look to it, but um, it's just going to be soft and fuzzy. It's not going to be a very sharp way of viewing this particular uh, point source of light. Now you'll notice something else though. This, is, this happens particularly in very, very large apertures. Let's say we were to stop this lens down and get rid of some of these adjacent or some of these outward most uh, lens rays, you'd be able to, if you followed some of these paths of light, you would see that these outward ones or these outside ones are the ones that are doing the most damage, so to speak, to our, to our image. So by stopping down and using the ones that are more in the center here, we can see that we were, are more likely to get a sharper image. And if you, uh, if you don't believe this, then uh, you can take a look at this, uh, this slide and, and just follow the optical path and just get rid of some of the outside ones until you, uh, until you determine that, um, um, that this is true. Now this is called spherical aberration because this lens is created as though it were from the surface of a sphere. Now the way that um, optical technicians or optical engineers rather could fix this would be to use a lens type that's called an aspherical uh, lens element. And sometimes you'll see this, the lens manufacturers love to, to describe all the special sort of lens elements that are inside of their lens. And, and an aspherical lens element will try to correct this particular source of, of thing because it will not uh, cause such a wild variation in where this light is being focused. So, okay. So let's say now that we are taking a, a photo of, of this same point source of light, but we're not pointed straight at it. Let's say it's off to the corner of our frame. So as a result, the light is coming in at an angle. So this might be something that's off to the edge of our frame, for example. And so it's still going to be recorded on film. The light just isn't coming straight in through the lens. Now this can result in a different type of, of uh, optical aberration called coma. And, um, and the light will bend in such a way that it actually will have this sort of conical shape to it. Rather than being a point source, remember it should just be one specific point on the edge of the frame it's going to be this weird looking comet shaped. And that's actually where this, this name comes from. It looks sort of like a comet and for some reason they said, oh, let's get rid of the ET and put an A in, so it's called coma. Okay, so um, just to show you a different image of, of why this might happen, let's say that we have you know, a point source that's down here and it's going to go through the lens and, and be focused onto this point up there. Now, if we take the very center of this lens, we can see that we get actually a point at rendered correctly. But as we are focusing the light, so as, so remember that the light rays are coming into all portions of this lens. So not only the center, but also these outside rings as well. So as these outside rings are focusing the light, they're focusing it in different places than where the center aspect of this lens is focusing it. So just to go back here, the rays coming in through the center of the lens go up to you know, the correct portion, but then these outside areas are what are responsible for these really unusual rays of light. And so what this can look like in an actual photo, let's say we take a photo that looks like this. So this is, I think, just a photo 
some guy took of like a parking lot at night or something like that. And this photo does a good job demonstrating this problem. So we have here three boxes on top and three crops from this image, each crop representing its associated box up top. So the center box, you can see this looks correct. So these are point sources and you can see that they look like they should, just like little bulbs of light. But in this particular lens, the very outside, we get these weird coma shapes uh, as a result of, the, of, uh, of this lens altering the light or bending the light in an unusual way. Now, um, is there a way that we can correct this? Now, as you'll find out with most of the optical aberrations that exist within lenses, you can actually correct by stopping down. And so just as, as you might be able to tell, if we're stopping down, that means that we are getting rid of the light that is entering through these outermost areas of the lens, only using the light through the center. And so we are then able to get the most accurate rendition of that particular image. Okay, now, um, one of the last optical aberrations that I want to talk about is astigmatism. So those of you that, again, have glasses like me might be familiar with this, with this term. And um, if you're astigmatic, then you might know that things are, are, are bad for you. They're worse than if you just have plain old, you know, 20, 2010 vision or, you know, ever so slightly um, near or far sightedness because objects are rendered differently than they actually appear in the real world. And more specifically, a circle, for example, let's say if you're astigmatic or your eyes uh, are astigmatic and you see a circle, what you would actually see is more of an ellipse shaped. And so it really messes up with the, with the geometry of specific objects it can, it can, and it can do really weird things to the way that you, the, that you view the world. Luckily, there's obviously ways that we can correct that, but lenses are not so lucky. We don't have glasses or contacts for lenses, so we have to sometimes deal with astigmatism here. So um, if a lens has an astigmatism problem, then what can happen is if we have a point source of light, so just a little point, just like in the previous photos, and it is bending light through all portions of the lens, sometimes this lens may not point all of those rays of light, you know, may not be able to bend them into one specific point, but more specifically, it may bend the lateral rays, so the, the, the rays that are going in horizontally, different from the vertical rays. So this means that you will, it'll actually modify the shape of, of this point as well. So rather than you getting a very nice point source, you might get something like this airy diffraction pattern, or you might get something weird, like these weird almost donut shapes that can exist. So, uh, so objects, I mean, this usually happens only for objects at sort of a weird oblique angle. Um, but if you are interested in astrophotography, for example, all of these aberrations will become a lot more obvious to you than they would in, say, perhaps real world photography. So just going around in the streets and taking lots of photos. Just because those, in those cases, you really are taking a photo of, of, um, of point sources of light throughout the entire image. You have lots of stars throughout the image and you can get a lot of strange aberrations there.